comes through it. And um, oh yeah, there you are. Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right, let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. And um, and yeah, I think you're gonna enjoy it. And um, and we're gonna see this thread that, that from Genesis to to Revelation. And like I said, it's called River Runs Through It. It's not the movie with I think Robert Reffer. Remember that, you know? It's a, and it's another exciting Bible prophecy. So okay, so let's go ahead. And Andy, can you fix the mic a little bit? Thank you. Let's go ahead and do our, um, our seminar model. You should know it by heart and say it as loud as possible. <laughs> All right, you ready? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, it is not for me. Amen. I hope that you're making that your personal model as you study the Bible. Are you? You know, make it your personal model. You're going to notice, guys, and I hope you have, that you're not hearing me say, believe what I say. Have you heard me say that? I am, I'm always going to encourage you, go to the Bible, read the Bible, study it up for yourself. And if it's not there, stick to the Bible, whatever's in the Bible, because that's our only safety. And um, we've been together now 14, 14 nights. <laughs> Some of you are amazing. You haven't missed a single one. So I, I, I just can tell that the Lord is just blessing you guys in, in so many ways, and you're learning, and we're all learning, and that's always a great blessing. So all right, let's sing our theme song now. Eventually, I'm going to take this one off too. <laughs> That'll save me an extra slide. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Us. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, Judy. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to come out night after night to study your word. What a privilege it is to open your word, to know that you are so eager, Lord, to reveal yourself to us so that we can know you, that we can know more of your love for us, more of your plan, the future, what you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that has been a great teacher to open our understanding and convict our hearts. I pray that tonight as we study your word again, Lord, that you will bless this hour together and that we will continue to learn more about you so that we can follow the Lamb wherever he leads. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All righty. Okay, so our topic, a river runs through it. So tonight we're going to relax a little bit, okay? And again, this is one of my favorite topics. We've done some major prophetic themes, right? So tonight we're going to relax a little. And, and this, touch, this subject for a lot of people, some people, let me just say it that way, they kind of trivialize it a little bit because they think it's not important, okay? But if it's in the Bible, is it important? <laughs> Yes, and the Bible actually treats it as absolutely essential, the topic we're going to study. And it, as I've gotten to know a few of you, which has been such a joy for me, I know that for some of you this will be review, but I think that, that um, it's important that we cover it because it's something that deserves to be understood by everyone, okay? So most nights we start where? In the book of Revelation, right? But tonight we're actually going to do something a little different. We're going to start in the book of Genesis, okay? The first book of the Bible, which happens to be one of the big keys, right, in the book of Genesis that helps us understand the last book of Revelation, okay? So in order to understand the book of Revelation, we need to understand the book of Genesis. But let's take a moment to review some of those 
principles and keys that, that we've shared throughout our time together. So remember I, I mentioned two-thirds of the language in the book of Revelation is borrowed from where? For other parts of the Bible, exactly. For example, Daniel chapter 5 proved to be the key to understand the ultimate fall of Babylon. So if you want to understand the ultimate fall of Babylon, you go to Daniel chapter 5, right? And in our next meeting, we're actually going to cover the rest of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. We only covered a little bit of that, and that's going to unlock Revelation 13 and also Daniel chapter 3, where you have this fiery furnace and this command to worship the image. Okay, so we're going to go over that. And if you want to understand Bible prophecy, you have to read how much of the Bible? <laughs> all of it. We have to read all of it. Remember the story of Elijah was another important key. Remember in, in the book of First King, Elijah confronts the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel and one of the mountains of Megiddo. A lot of you have mentioned that Armageddon one, that Mount of Megiddo, how that was something that was very interesting and new to you. And remember, there was a pagan queen, and she marries an Israelite king, right? And God's people begin to what? To compromise, okay? And Elijah has hidden the wilderness for three and a half years, and you'll notice the woman, which represents what? The church in Revelation chapter 12, she also hides in the wilderness for three and a half years. So we're going to be looking at, at that a little bit too at another time. Then the Ten Commandments, how, was that an important key as we study the Ten Commandments? Okay, I want I to turn you guys to turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastics. So grab your Bible, that's in the Old Testament, okay? It's one of those books, you got to look for it because it's a little book. Right, and it comes right after the book of Proverbs. So you have Psalms, then you have Proverbs, and then you have the book of Ecclesiastics. And I like this verse because it kind of ties the Ten Commandments directly to the judgment. And I'm so used to teaching in a class, I, will, I was about to say, can someone read that for me? But I think I better read it because I have the mic. All right, are you there? The book of Ecclesiastics, right after Proverbs, chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Okay, when you're all there, say amen. All right, I think I heard a faint one on this side, so let me wait for this side. All right, I love hearing the pages of the Bible moving. That means that you're going straight to the Bible. Look what it says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's awe. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. I love this verse because it says, listen, let's wrap it all up into one simple sentence. And it says, fear God. Does that mean be afraid of God? No, it says, worship God, reverend God, get to know God, follow God, and keep his commandments. Why? Because his commandments what? are a reflection of his character. He wants to write his name and his character in our mind and our hearts, right? It says, for this is man's awe. You, you, you see that there? This is the conclusion of the matter here. It's a, and then it goes on saying, God will bring every good work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Now, do we need to be afraid of the judgment if we're in Christ? No, as long as we are in Christ, it is, God, it is Christ who stands before us in that judgment and offers his life and his sacrifice on our behalf. Amen. That's good to know. Amen. So anyway, we, we read that. And of course, Revelation 13, again, talks about the name and the character written and, um, and the keeping of the Ten Commandments. Then we went to the book of Exodus is another important key. God's people are traveling to an earthly promised land and an earthly Jerusalem, right? And they leave after the plagues fall on, e on Egypt. In the book of Revelation, there are also plagues, okay? God's people arrive in the heavenly promised land. So you notice to, you're starting to notice we see something in Revelation, and John is referring us to a story in the other part of the Bible so you can understand what Revelation is trying to say, okay? And I know that for some, maybe these stories are new, so I encourage you to read those stories because it's going to make understanding the book of Revelation really, really uh, more clear. 
okay? And you'll notice in Revelation 15, they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So there's also a sanctuary, right? And what is, how important is the sanctuary, <laughs> right? It was important because it shows us, um, shows up in just about every chapter in the book of Revelation, you'll find something regarding the sanctuary, okay? It just goes to show you have to read part of the Bible in order to understand it. Part of the Bible? <laughs> I was checking, all right? You guys are still reading Ecclesiastics. Is that what it was? <laughs> you got to read the whole thing, right? And again, so I encourage you to, to kind of to read as much of the Bible, to study it, and all these things will start falling into, into place. And tonight we're going to go to the book of Genesis, and we're going to pick, off, pick up where we le uh, left off in chapter 2. All right, so let's, let's start with Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And I want you to notice how clear the Bible record is, right? It doesn't say the human beings crawled out of some amoeba somewhere, right? It doesn't say that we slowly evolved out of the single-celled, um, organism. When I was little and I, and I was hearing about this theory of evolution, I used to live close to the Bronx Zoo, and I would go often because I wanted to see if that gorilla was eventually going to become a man, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so the Bible is very clear, right, that God formed the human race. He made us deliberately the way we are, okay? Each one of us is special, right? People might want to debate this, but they can't debate it biblically, all right, because the language is very clear. So you and I are God's special creation. How do you feel about that? Do you know that you're God's special creation? That God made you just the way you are and different than anybody else? But we know that sin and sin would have us think that we're not. I, I feel for so many, especially our young people, that they feel that they don't have any sense of value and self-worth. And they need to know that they were created by a God who loves them, that they were not an accident. Amen? So, uh, so look what it says. It says, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I want to stop there for a moment because you know that God made this whole planet. It, what would have happened if God made the whole planet of one color? What if every single fruit and vegetable just tasted one way? How enjoyable would, would it be? You know, we take for granted, right, that all the different colors and all the different tastes that we serve a God, right, that is creative, right, a God that, that is, just can create such beauty for us so that we can enjoy food. Amen? The world is full of taste and it's full of color, and I'm grateful for that. And um, so let's continue reading. So it goes on, it says, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Okay? It says, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now a river went out of Eden toward to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. So God thought of absolutely everything. He even installed a perfect irrigation system in the garden, okay? The river ran right through the garden, and this was the way human beings were supposed to live. Do we get that? That it, this is the way we were meant to live, <laughs> all right? We never had to worry about money. We were, we were not made to worry about taxes, <laughs> to worry about money, bills, health care plans, retirement, saving, and even death. That's not what God had originally created us. Um, that wasn't part of God's design for us. So in the beginning, he gave us this perfect home, and, and a river ran through it. So now let me show you something really interesting because the Bible finishes um, the way it began. There's also a river in the book of Revelation. Look what it says. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. And on either side 
of the river, the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Do you realize what this means? Right? That even though we blew it, even though that we sin, what is God planning to do? He's planning to restore it, to give it back to us. Even the tree of life is going to come back. Isn't that exciting? Right? The Bible starts with a garden and it ends with a garden. It starts with a river and it ends with a river. Okay? It starts with a curse falling on the human race because we turn our back on God. And then the curse is lifted in the book of Revelation. Okay? So let's go on. And then it says, um, l- let's read this part again. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So think about what this means. No meaningless, thankless work. You don't have to work like this anymore. No more disease, no more suffering, no more death. Okay? I'll say it for you. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's exciting news, my friend. God says all that will be a thing of the past. Oh, how many here long for that day? No more. Amen. All right. It says they shall see his face and his name shall be on their forehead. So you and I are going to see the face of God. You know, when Moses wanted to see God, he had to be shielded because looking at the face of God, right, would have been too much for a sinful mortal person. But once the curse is lifted, that's going not, that's not going to be a problem. We're going to see the face of God. I can't wait for that. I can't wait to look into the eyes of God. And the name of God will be written on our foreheads. Our character, his, God's character will be written in our hearts. We have accepted the gift of Christ and we, and we have allowed God to recreate his image in us. Look what the second book, second Corinthians says that he makes us a new creation. All right. Um, that's in second Corinthians. So as soon as Adam and Eve rem- were removed from the garden, God promises to send a seed. Remember we read that in Genesis three fifteen. his son, Jesus Christ, he would come to crush the head of the serpent, which represents Satan, right? And win eternity for the human race. In the book of Revelation, he's the slain lamb um, of God and leads us back into paradise. The Bible calls him another Adam, all right, the, the new head of the human race. Between paradise lost and paradise restored, you'll find the cross of Christ. That's the connection between both, the cross. And that cross says that you can start all over again. So let me ask you, are there things in your life that you deeply regret? Are there things in your life that you deeply regret? You know, I know that I have done some really, really dumb things. (laughs) Things that I, I regret, but I praise God that in spite of those things, he's forgiven me and he has saved me. So have you ever wished that you could rewind the tape, right, or the CD now? right? (laughs) And that you can start all over again, that you can start all over again. Sometimes it's small things and sometimes it's far serious things that we have done. Broken relationships, broken trust, a broken home, things that the reality is that we can't fix. But tonight the Bible says that you can start again. But you may say, well, you, Lillian, you haven't, you don't know what I've done. (laughs) It doesn't matter (laughs) what you have done. God says you can start over, and if God said it, we believe it. Amen? So the only problem that most people have is actually believing that God really means it. You know that God's hardest job is to get us to believe. It's interesting that the Bible has, I don't know, over 2,000 promises, right, of God's love and his assurance and his power, right? And then the devil comes and tells us one thing, and we believe the devil, and the 2,000 promises go out the door. Tell me if if that's not true. (laughs) You know, it's the truth, right? So it just seems too good to be true sometimes. It may be because we struggle to believe that God's forgiveness is real, my friend, that it actually applies to us. He gives us 
a hands-on tangible symbol to reassure us that it's true. He gives us, you an, an object lesson that, to remind you that your new beginning is real. So um, he lets the river of paradise actually flow into our hearts. So take a careful look at the, f at the first thing Jesus did with his public ministry. The minute that Jesus started his public ministry, what did he do? Do you remember? What did Jesus do the moment that he started his public ministry? Okay, he actually stepped into a river, right? The Son of God, in spite of the fact that he was sinless, was baptized. When he started his public ministry, that's the first thing he did. Now, what does baptism have to do with Bible prophecy? More than you expect. We'll see in a minute. It's a symbol. It's a token. It's a down payment on the kingdom that's coming. It's a way to stand in the river right now before, even before you see God face to face. But I've noticed something very strange when it comes to the subject of baptism. Okay, the Bible makes it clear in passages like Mark 16, and you're going to see it in Matthew 28 also, that Christian baptism is absolutely essential and it's critical. Okay, I'm not, a, it's not an optional thing, and it's very clear that it, in the Bible that it's a very important thing. But when Christians get together to discuss baptism for some reason, okay, I notice that we love to argue. <laughs> we love to argue on how it's done, <laughs> okay? Is baptism really important is the argument, okay? It, how should we get baptized is another issue, right? When should we get baptized? So unfortunately, Christians can be very good at arguing these things sometimes. It's a problem that happens when we place our own opinion above God's opinion, right? So instead of reading the whole thing about what the Bible says and what God says, unfortunately, it's an opinion. I heard this story the other day, and I thought it was pretty interesting. They were the um, two Christian bu businessmen talking at a restaurant at lunchtime. And then one of them said, I'm a better Christian than you. And the other Christian said, really? You're a horrible Christian. What do you mean? And he goes, listen, I'll bet you 10 bucks that you can't even recite the Ten Commandments. Right? And the guy said, yeah, I'll take that bet. Right? He goes, okay, go ahead. He goes, and he suddenly goes, he goes, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And the other guy looked at him, astonished, and he said, I really didn't think you knew them. Here's the 10 bucks. <laughs> so, so basically, neither one of them <laughs> knew the Ten Commandments. The fact is that Christians spend a lot of time arguing, arguing. There's a pretty good chance we're all wrong when we bring our own opinion. So what you and I think never matters. Are you with me, guys? What matters is what? What God thinks. What matters is what we find out in the word of God as we read it. And that's our only safety. And if you read the whole book, the answers become really clear. I know some of you have started to kind of put all these pieces together. And you're saying, wow, I never even realized it was that clear. That's if we read the Bible and we read it. So the Bible isn't some old fiddle that you can use to play any tune you want. And that's another problem where I'm going to, Put that square peg in a round hole to fit what I want it to say. That's another problem, right? The Bible doesn't give us 20 different stories, all right? It's remarkably, remarkably cohesive. It really all fits together. So tonight, why don't we just turn to Jesus and let him speak to us on this uh, subject of baptism, okay? He's always going to make it clear, and we need to be clear because baptism is not unimportant. It's a command from God. So what does Jesus tell us about baptism? Let's look at the story, okay? It says in Matthew chapter 3, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. So John was what? He was horrified. <laughs> He was like, I mean, here's the perfect sinless son of God, and he wants to be baptized. He knows full well that Jesus doesn't actually need to be baptized because Jesus isn't a sinner, right? So look, it goes on. But Jesus answered and said to him, 
permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he followed him so notice what jesus says jesus says that baptism is what it's the right thing to do it says it's the righteous thing to do okay so why was jesus baptized it's obvious that he wasn't a sinner so why do you think he was baptized that's a good one. It says maybe because he wants to set an example. Exactly, Tom. Jesus' whole life was an example for us. Amen? And that's why Christians try to follow in his footsteps. He's not only God in human flesh, but he's also the perfect human life. So that's why if, we, if you try to em emulate Jesus, then you're not going to go wrong. Okay? Now pay very close attention to what happens next. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this is a very big moment. God publicly announces his Son at this moment. This is Daniel chapter 9 coming to pass. All right, I want your mind to think about that big prophecy in, in the 2300-day prophecies in Daniel chapter 9 where it told us and predicted the very moment that Jesus would come and start his public ministry. It's the 483 years that, that they had to rebuild Jerusalem and the Messiah to come. So now, not because he needs it, right, but because he's setting an example for us. He's showing us what we need to do. In the Bible, baptism is a very important symbol, and I want you to remember that. This is not just an optional activity. It's a believer's, I love this, first public act of witnessing. Isn't that something? Okay. It's the first thing you do to share Jesus with other people. Okay. Baptism was specifically designed to teach something very important to the world. The same way the Old Testament sanctuary was specifically designed to show the plan of salvation to the world. Remember, that was the whole point of that sanctuary. Um, so is baptism. And what does baptism show the world? Well, listen to the words of Paul in Romans chapter 6. It says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So baptism is a very specific symbol, isn't it? It represents a, a brand new life, okay, and a brand new person. It shows the world the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So baptism is a death burial and a resurrection okay it also shows it tells the world that the old you right with all your sins and all your destructive habits it all died with jesus amen <laughs> right and a brand new creature was born <laughs> all right jesus died and was buried and the old sinner also died and was buried with him then Jesus rose from the dead, and the new you comes out of the grave. It also, and of course, it also shows the world that one day you will be literally come back from the grave because Jesus also did. All right, so even if I should die, I have the assurance just like Jesus rose from the dead, he would he will also res resurrect me. So baptism tells the whole world that you believe, 
that and what is it that you believe you believe that jesus forgives your sin you believe that jesus rose from the dead you believe that he also has power to make you part of his kingdom you believe in that power to literally raise you from the dead and you believe in the good news of the salvation of jesus christ that's what you're publicly declaring to the world that i believe in the salvation so question, how does baptism convey that message? Unfortunately, we need to ask that question because listen carefully, in, in the 21st century, there's confusion about that. And it wasn't so in the past. Now we're confused about it, but it wasn't so. So today, there seems to be a lot of variety of ways that people get baptized, okay? And that's kind of strange because Ephesians chapter four talks about one Lord, one faith and one baptism okay so let's look at the next one all right so let's go let's look at some of the ones that 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 are popular all right so there's baptism by immersion so that means that you go under the water okay then there's baptism by trimersion so that means that you go under the water three times and that's how they baptize you, okay? Then there's the baptism by aspiration, which means basically they just sprinkle water on you. And then there's other people believe um, in, in, in um, baptism by infusion, meaning that they pour the water over your head, right? And then I heard people baptize with salt because you know how the Bible says you are the salt of the earth, right? Then then the others that baptize by sprinkling oil because oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, all right? And then there's also some who believe in sprinkling with wine because wine represents is part of the communion service, so there's some that do that, right? And then even right now, there's even baptism by mail order. You can just send 20 bucks and you're done. <laughs> You know, and then there's another one I heard today, too, that it's it's you can they just declare you from a distance baptism. So I I call that the dry cleaning <laughs> baptism. Right. You don't even have to get wet. Just I declare you bapt baptized. Right. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I just gave you a few. Today, there are hundreds of different ways that people try to express this message. God is trying to share with the world through baptism. All right, and maybe it doesn't matter, okay, but maybe God is in all that particular when it comes to how people do this, but except for this, right, and that is that when you read the Bible and you discover that God is very particular with his symbols, very. Are you with me? You, we can't decide what a symbol means. God decides what his symbols mean, Amen. So think of the story of Cain and Abel. Remember how Cain offered, um, Abel offered a lamb, right? Exactly what God had asked him. The lamb was a symbol of what? It was symbolic of the faith that the Messiah would come one day, right? And it pointed to what? Those symbols all pointed to the cross of Christ. And that's way back in the, in the book of um, Hebrew, you say, you, it would read that it says that f by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice because of what it represented, right? But then Cain did something else. What did he bring? <laughs> he brought fruits and vegetables. You think that they were beautiful fruits and vegetables? Absolutely, right? And it's almost like he was defying, well, he was defying God, saying, listen, I know what God asked for a lamb, but really, what does it matter? A lamb is, um, is a little inconvenient. These vegetables and fruits, they're just as good. So I'm going to bring some potatoes and carrots, and that should be good enough. Right? That was his attitude. So in other words, this was a man-made designer religion that completely missed the point. So God's symbols are very specific. They mean something. Remember the whole sanctuary, right, that we covered Right? They were all built on very specific things in that sanctuary. And there was no freedom for expression. You know, Moses, when he got the instruction, he couldn't go, well, I think we should put the curtains yellow, you know. <laughs> Everything was specific. Why? Because God is trying to convey a specific message. Did you pick up what I just said? 
The reason the symbols are specific is because God is trying to convey a specific message through those symbols so we don't get a right to change them or to say they mean something else. So it's like a communion service, right? The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he took wine. And what did he say? That the bread represented the body, that the blood represented um, his blood, and he was very specific with that, right? You wouldn't dream of deciding, I'm going to bring cheese doodles and orange juice to the communion service. What if you went somewhere and that's what they did, right? So it's not. God's symbols are always meant to convey a specific message. And, it, and this particular communion service, it, it conveys what? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of God. All right? So how does it do that? Well, again, if you want to know the right thing to do, just watch Jesus. Look what it says in Matthew 3.16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. All right? So I, so I like um, the way the old, test, the old King James Version says. It says he, came, he went up straightway out of the water. All right? So the only way that Jesus can come out of the water is what? <laughs> if he went into the water. Are you with me? So he can only do that, of course, if he went in. So the fact is that Jesus was baptized the only way the church knew how hundreds and hundreds of years. They were following this process for hundreds of years, and Jesus got baptized the same way. So the word baptize, the, the, the actual meaning, right, means something specific. So the Greek word is baptizo, which literally means to immerse, to go under the water. That's what the word means. So it's a word that comes from the cloth dyeing industry when they would dip a cloth, right, into a vat of, of dye. That's where that word came from. And they also called it, so that means that that cloth was completely immersed. And every time you see the word baptism in the Bible, that's exactly what it means. Someone was dipped under the water, all right? And if you look at the Bible record carefully, that becomes really obvious. Let's look at the story of John the Baptist. It says, and John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, why would John need a place with much water in order to baptize, right? Um, he could have just, you know, it's because he was dipping people in water, so he needed a place where there was plenty of water so he can actually do what, what was what was common method at that time he could have just asked for a cup of water and then just sprinkle everybody as they went by but that's not what he did right look at the story of the ethiopian eunuch let's look at that philip is studying with this ethiopian ethiopian eunuch and he was a government official from ethiopia and then suddenly the man wanted to make a decision so look what it says let me Clickers now. And Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, I really like this verse because that's a great attitude to have, isn't it? You know, nothing can, can keep this man back. As he was learning and he was seeing what the Bible says about baptism and following Christ, he said, what hinders me? Okay, once he saw Jesus, once he understood what it meant to be a Christian, nobody had to ask him to do it. Nobody, because he understood. All right, so now Philip said, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, that's an important thought, right? And we'll come back to that a little later. But one of the prerequisites for baptism is what? Well, you got to believe, <laughs> right? If you don't believe, right, then what's the point? Because of what it symbolizes, right? So let me ask you, why did they both go down into the water? Why not just stand on the side and get a few drops? It's because baptism was always by immersion, Okay, it's the only method they knew. 
It's the only thing that they called baptism and knew exactly what it means. So this is a very important symbol. Are you with me, guys? It's a death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what it symbolized. It's your public marriage to Christ, right? Notice what the Bible says. Look what it says. For as many as you as have been baptized into Christ has put on Christ, okay? So baptism is how you become part of the family of God. You put on Christ. You become part of his kingdom. The OU is gone, and you become now part of the church. That's what the Bible teaches in Acts chapter 2. Everybody was baptized. Everyone in chap Acts chapter 2, it says that, they were added to the church. Everyone that was baptized was added to the church. Baptism tells the whole world that you what? That you believe. Okay? It's like a marriage, right? Um, when you get married, right, you tell the whole world. You do it publicly or do you do it secretly? You do it in front of witnesses, right? Well, I'm sure there are some cases, but, you know. But normally when you get married, you do it publicly because what? You're proud that you're about to get married. Right? So, ladies, let me ask you a question. What if a, what if a man proposes to you, right? He says, listen, I love you. I want to marry you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. But let's get married secretly because I don't want my friends and family to know that I married you because they, they will tease me, and I'm a little embarrassed about that. Raise your hand if you would be excited about that proposal. <laughs> I would be like, what? <laughs> That would be the end there, okay? So, you know, you don't get married in secret, and you don't put on Christ in secret either. Listen to the words of Jesus. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. When you become part of the family of God, what are you doing? You tell the whole world. That's what you do. You show, them, you show them the death and burial resurrection. It's your first act of witnessing. I love that statement. It's telling the world, this is, this is what I'm doing. And you're declaring this be um, before your family. In recent years, though, as clear as it is in the Bible and in history, there's been quite a few confusions in the last few years. So we've got to wonder, how did it get all mixed up like that? Okay, why do we have hundreds of different methods when it comes to baptism? So I'm sure you, most of you have probably figured it out. Every time we get to a part where, where did they get that from? It seems like it always comes at that period of time in history when the church, what, started to compromise, right? It always kind of goes back to the heart of the dark ages. And by the way, when I was in school and I was studying the Dark Ages, I just thought there was no light during that time period in history <laughs> until I really came to the church and realized that's not what it meant. So look, at, look how, how Cardinal James, Cardinal Gibbon says, for several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually confirmed by immersion. But since the 12th century, the practice of baptism by infusion has prevailed, as this matter is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. So here's the truth. For 1,100 years, everybody got baptized by immersion. And then there was a change, right? Just like when we studied the Sabbath this weekend, right? And why did they change? Based on that statement, why did they change? <laughs> It was inconvenient, right? The medieval church, Europe, was not a warm place, and by the 1300, it was experiencing an iceberg freeze, and some days it was really cold, and by this time, the clergies were wearing those real thick robes, and going down in the water was really inconvenient for them. So they made a decision not to do the water anymore. But, but in the beginning, baptism, again, was always by immersion. That's the way God designed it to be. Check out the history books. It always is by immersion. Um, this is coming from St. John's Church in the 4th century, right? What is that there? there were, that was a baptistry. And this was 300 years in the 4th century, 300 years after Christ. You notice a pool? Why did they have a pool? Because they were baptized by immersion there. 
This is a mural from North Africa that also dates back to the fourth century. It's a picture of the baptism of Jesus. And what do you notice in that picture? Jesus is under the water, right? Because Jesus was baptized by immersion. There's a massive ancient church in the city of um, Istanbul, which became a mosque in later years. But at one point, this was the biggest Christian church in the world. It, um, they called it Haggai Sophia, um, or the Church of the Holy Wisdom. And it was built by the Emperor Justin in the 6th century. And you can see all these little dome buildings there next to them. One of those little buildings were actually an ancient baptistry with a big pool. And now this was 500 years after Christ, and they were still baptizing by immersion. And then you have the 10th century. Now we're a thousand years after Christ. And Val uh, um, Valdemar, um, Val <laughs> I said it right earlier today. <laughs> Gladimir, is it? Uh, the great is living, right? And he decides to convert Christianity. So he gets baptized and he paints he, this wonderful painting. And notice, what, what do you see there? A pool and what do you see? It's a big pool, and he's being baptized. And again, this is a 1,000 years after Christ. Now we're in the 12th century. This is the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which dates back to the 12th century. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa is the bell tower for a cathedral that has a baptistry building right in the back. So here it is there, right? And why? Now this is a 1,100 years after Christ, and they're still baptizing by immersion. So listen to this cardinal's word. The immersion of the candidate represents the death of Christ. Amen? While he is under the water, the burial of Christ is being represented. When he comes out of the water, the resurrection is being represented. So we know that in the 12th century, they practiced the same thing. But then as we move on to the 14th century, now we're 1,300 years after Christ, a change starts to happen, right? Look what um, Thomas Aquinas says, uh, one of the great doctors of the church describing the change. I want you to listen to this carefully. He says, baptism may be given not only by immersion, but also by a fusion of water or sprinkling with it. But it is the safe way to baptize by immersion because that is the most common custom. So did you catch that? So he recognizes now that there's other methods, right? And he prefers which method? Immersion. Okay, why? Because it was the way that they were doing it for 1,300 years. So the official change didn't come until 1311, right? Look what it says. It was at the Council of Ravenna, 1311, that sprinkling and pouring were acceptable as methods of baptism, okay? So... 1,300 years after the disciples and all of that, were, you know, it was, it was change, okay? Now, that was never God's plan, right? God didn't sanction that, right? And because of that, now the symbol that was there by baptism, by immersion, was compromised, okay? And if you go back to history, you look at a lot of the prominent Christians, they recognize that the change was a mistake, Look what um, John Wesley said. I believe it is a duty to observe so far as I can to baptize by immersion. John Calvin said the very word baptize, however, signifies to immerse. And it is certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. Then you have Martin Luther. On this account, I can wish that such as are to be baptized should be completely immersed into water. His According to the meaning of the word and to the significance of the ordinance, all, as also without a doubt, it was instituted by, by what? By Christ. So baptism was always by immersion. There was no doubt about it. It was the right thing to do, right? And in the words of Jesus, it was the righteous thing to do. Now, some of us were Christian when we were babies. Raise your hand if you were Christian when you... Uh, Christian when you were babies, right? Okay, so I was, I was also, and our parents obviously did that to honor God, because that's the question now, well, what about when you Christian a baby, right? 
And, and again, I was, and my mom did it to honor God and my dad. And I know that, you know, God smiles when parents care enough, right, to make Jesus a part of their, their children's life. So we have to respect that. And I wish that actually more parents, right, um, were more conscious of, of their children and God being um, part of, 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 of the life of Jesus, Right? So they simply did it to do the right thing, right, and get baptized, um, but it wasn't the way Jesus was baptized, right? So that raises a good question. When and why should you get baptized? Okay, the Bible talks about three things that need to happen before you're baptized. So here's three quick things I'm going to quickly go over, right? First, you have to what? That means that you got to confess your sins, you got to turn away from them. And look what Peter says. He says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So baptism symbolized the death of the sinner and the birth of the new believer. It also makes sense that you got to admit that you're a sinner and that you need help, right? you got to admit, the Bible says that you've got to repent of your sins. Baptism isn't, listen, a good luck charm. There's nothing, this is our baptistry back here. There's nothing magical in that water, okay? You know, it's what it symbolizes and what you come prepared, you know. There's no superstitial ritual in this. It's an outward declaration of what already has taken place inward in your life, Okay? So the second thing, it says what? The Bible teaches that you've got to what? All right, we've already seen that in the story of the eunuch, right? So let's go back there for a moment. It says, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to believe? So what does it mean to believe? Does it mean that you just know what the Bible says, that it's just a, a mental ascent of information in your mind, right? To be, it, it really, to believe in Jesus means that you plan to what? You plan to follow what Jesus is showing you. There's many that say they believe, but they're not following Christ. So is that really believing, right? Um, it means that your life begins to change, that's what it means to believe. So the Bible teaches that we repent, we believe, and then we what? And then we understand what we're doing. It's just like getting married, right? Before you get married, you know, most ministers, they want to do what? They want to spend time counseling you so the two people come into their marriage, right? They know what they're coming into, right? And, that's, and, and they want to make sure that everybody that comes to that marriage covenant, right, is coming with eyes wide open. Is that a good thing? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? So you also, and how many of you, when you sign a contract, you don't read it? You read the contract, don't you, before you sign that contract, that's, okay? So um, the Bible teaches in Acts chapter 2 that baptism is the way that people join the church. Not just um, being marked as a believer, you become part of the family of God and you're being drafted into the mission of God's church. That's another important thing. You know, it doesn't mean, that when you get baptized, that does, churches shouldn't be full of spectators. Are you hearing me? It shouldn't be filled with long rangers. Well, I just want Christ, but I don't want to be part of the church, right? I want to be baptized, but I'm just going to sit in the church and do nothing. You know, part of God has given each one of you gifts, special gifts. And guess what those gifts are, are for? It's so that we can work together, right, to do what? To tell the world about Jesus and that Jesus is coming. So it's important that we understand also, and it's also important to make sure that you agree with what the church with, with what the church teaches that you're joining. Right, First um, Timothy three fifteen says that the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth, and you want to make sure that the church that you're joining does what it teaches the truth. It teaches what's in the Bible. 
Listen carefully to the words of Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. Amen. So Jesus says make disciples, and that means to uh, to teach other people to follow Jesus, right? Show them what Jesus teaches and believes. And then it goes on to say, to, so that they can observe all things that God has commanded. So this is why for the last tw um, 2,000 years, ministers have always reviewed, right, the teachings on the Bible before they baptize you. This is why these seminars, we do this so that you can learn about Jesus as you come to make that this, um, that decision to be baptized. It's a God-given duty of the church, right, to be able to instruct and then invite someone to be baptized. So there, there you have it, three steps, three prerequisites to baptism. Is it clear, my friend, right? Because, I, you know, this is an important thing. Before you can be baptized, you have to repent of your sins. You have to believe in Jesus Christ and understand what it means to follow him. Here's the question. Look at those three things. Can a baby do this? No, a baby can't do that, right? The truth is that they can't. Babies can't repent and believe and understand. They frankly don't understand anything. They're babies, right? So baptism is, um, so was baptism meant for babies? No, the answer is no, my friends. Listen, during the medieval period, the church started baptizing babies. And you know why they did that? Right? Because there was a high infant mortality, and they felt that if that baby wasn't baptized within the first, I don't know, seven, eight days, right, that if they die, that God would reject them. And that's the way that they, they thought. But the problem is that baby baptism is not in the Bible. You're not going to find that there. All right? So is there something that we can do for the children? Okay? Of, of course, we, there's something we can do. The Bible says that Jesus was dedicated in the temple as a baby. Remember that story? And many Christian parents do the same today. And what it is basically is that you understand as a parent, right, that you're making a personal decision that you want to make sure that that child grows up understanding God and Jesus and the Bible so that when that baby is old enough, then what happens? The baby can make that decision, right? Parents are actually, when a, a parent dedicates their children, what they're doing is publicly saying right in front of the church that they plan to raise this child in the fear of God <laughs> in a godly home. Isn't that a wonderful practice, right? So the problem is they're, um, 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 you know, they're making that right decision so that the baby can grow up and make the right decision. Now, there's one more important thing that we should look at, and then I'm going to close, right? Is it ever appropriate to be rebaptized a second time, right? So some people say yes, and some people say no, but let's check out what the Bible says. There's a remarkable story. There's a story in Acts chapter 19 where Paul discovers a group of believers, and they've never heard about the Holy Spirit, right? And why? You know, because they were baptized under John the Baptist, and, they, and he had died, you know, um, before Jesus' ministry was finished. And let's look what it says. And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there was a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So pay attention. These people had a valid baptism, right? But now look what happens, okay? When they heard this, they were what? 
baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay? So they were baptized again, the Bible says. So why? Because they wanted to commit to a deeper truth that they had learned. They had not known about the Holy Spirit. They wanted to publicly express their faith was now deeper because of the new things that they had lo- learned. So is it biblical to be rebaptized? Yeah, it is, right? And, and so you can be rebaptized again. And there's some reasons for doing that. So let's look at a, a couple of those reasons. Let's say you've never been baptized by immersion. If your first baptism was some other way, let's say, then you really need to be baptized again. Okay, remember that list of other methods. If it wasn't by immersion, but any other method, then you need to be rebaptized. If your life in recent years has been a denial of faith, if you have wandered away from the church, then you need to be rebaptized. If your experience is richer and deeper and you want to commit to a better understanding of Jesus, then it's completely appropriate to be rebaptized. And of course, if you've never been baptized, right, then you need to be baptized. So it's a brand new start, my friends. You get to wipe away the past. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> right? All the hurt, all the pain, all the mistakes, even before Jesus comes, you get to step into that river of God. Okay? So let me ask you, who here needs a brand new start? <laughs> Amen? Amen. This sinful world, my friend, is dying, and, and there's not a lot of much time. Can you sense it? Right? And tonight, our Heavenly Father wants you to know that, listen, I love you, I forgive you, and you can start all over right now. (laughs) Isn't that great? Right? The message, that message, you can see every time you look at that cross of Calvary, you can see that message, I love you, I forgive you, and you can start all over it's all, and, and, and again, this, this, um, it can be yours absolutely right now. Right now, I want to give you an opportunity to claim that new beginning. Okay, I know a couple of you have already indicated that you want to be baptized, and that's so exciting. And, you know, we believe that a person needs to be prepared for baptism, right? So I'm going to ask the ushers to come down because there are certain nights when I always want to get your feedback. So go ahead, ushers, and start handing them out. And then we're going to go through these. um, And I'm going to have Judy play for us for a moment. I want you to to think about, as you get those cards, please, everyone take a card, right? No pressure here at all. But I do want to give you an opportunity to respond. Was the message clear, my friends? Is the message clear that baptism and what it signifies, right? So get, make sure everybody has a car, grab a pen also, right? And then we're going to go through this together. What a blessing to know that God gives us a chance to start all over, right? So let's look at the first one. It says, I surrender my life fully to Christ. You know, and I think everyone in this room should be able to check off that box, right? Because have you have come to, to see Jesus and what you, as you have come to learn what Jesus has done, right? Um, you know that it's time to make that decision, right? You, you simply want to check off that box. I surrender my life fully to Christ. Amen? All right, let's do the second one. I want to be baptized by immersion the way Jesus was baptized. This is your opportunity to follow in Christ's footsteps, right? And this is your opportunity to show the world that you want, that you believe. And what is it that you believe? That Jesus died, he was buried, and he resurrected for you also. And that you believe that because of this, you can start a brand new life in Christ Jesus. What a great... Thing. Check off that box if that's your desire. Number three, maybe you have been baptized, but after tonight, you just like to, you know, talk to someone. You have some questions, and you're thinking about, I want to be rebaptized because now I'm learning so much. I want, I want to publicly declare, wow, you know, I want to fully commit to all that God has been showing me. 
So you can feel free to go ahead and check that box. Okay, let's do number four. Maybe you just need prayer, help solving a problem, okay? You're going through stuff in your life, right? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to handle it, okay? And that's okay because guess who knows how to handle it? God knows how to handle every single problem that we're going through. And in fact, um, um, there's going to be a moment at the end. I want us to pray together tonight. Is that okay, my friends? I want to take these cards. I want to come down. I want us to pray together. So let's do the last one, right? You may, you, maybe after you, you've been studying, you, you just want to visit, right? You have questions. You, there's a lot that you've been learning, right? And whatever it is, you know, um, I know that I've been visiting with a few of you throughout the last few weeks. It's really been a blessing, and you just want to visit, Okay. So as you finish, ushers get ready to collect the cars, all right? And I want them to collect the cars, and when you finish collecting the cars, right, I want you to bring the cards up front, right? And then this is the invitation, my friends, okay? Tonight I want those cards to come up, and I want us to pray together. And I just want to invite you to this. Tonight I'm going to have my prayer team come up too, right? And this is what we want to pray, okay? Maybe you want a brand new start. That's what you want, right? You say, Lord, I want a brand new start. Then, then come up and let's pray together, okay? Maybe you want to thank God for what he has been showing you, for the things that you've been learning, and you want to say, Lord, I want to thank you for those things. Then come up and let's pray together, right? And then maybe you, there's something going on in your life right now. You're struggling with something. There's something you want to just leave at the altar and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to take this burn away from me, right? Then I invite you to come up and let's pray together tonight, okay? So let's pray. Let's ask God to bless us, right? And we can pray. So I invite you to come up now and, and we can pray together if you like. Amen? And I'm going to take these cards, right? And I want God to, to bless every one of these decisions here on these cards. I want God to come to, to bless us. And let me tell you, my friends, there's no pressure here, but I know that God's Spirit has been touching some of your hearts. I know God has been working on your heart. I know people are making decisions to be baptized. And what we want is just to God to bless us tonight. Amen? Amen? So let's pray, my friends, and let's ask God's blessing to be with us. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much, Father, for your word. I want to thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to start a brand new life. Lord, I want to thank you for what you have done for us, Jesus, on the cross. I want to thank you that you love us. I want to thank you for the promises, Lord, that that paradise lost you will restore, and you're inviting each one of us to be part of that paradise. And today, Father, there are decisions being made. Not this, it, These decisions are for you, decisions that say, I want to follow Jesus, Lord. And, Lord, and we just want to pray together. We want to declare to the world, Lord, that we want to follow you, that we believe in your salvation, that we believe in what you have done for each one of us. And, Lord, I thank you for each one of these precious, precious um, friends, Lord, <laughs> that have come up, Lord. I pray that whatever they're struggling with, whatever it is that they want to surrender to you, whatever decisions that they are now want to make, that you will bless them that you will bless them, Lord, and that they will come to believe your word with all their heart, mind, and soul. And I pray for each one that is here today, Lord. You know their hearts. I know your spirit is working, Lord. I know it, Lord, because when you read the word, you can't help but be transformed. So bless each one here, Lord. There are people that are struggling with health issues. I pray that you will heal them. 
There are people here that are struggling with strongholds and addiction. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will set them free even right now. I pray that, Lord, there are some that are dealing with depression and, and things, and I pray, Lord, that the light of your, your word may just remove that darkness and that the light and the joy and the peace that comes from following Jesus will come into their lives. Bless us all, Father. Thank you for this evening, Lord, and for sharing your word with us. And I just thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. All 